Um, and so thanks to Emphasis, thanks to uh, Nias um, for organizing this, for hosting this. Um, it's an opportunity for me to, uh, to also kind of put some thoughts down, things that I've been thinking about. Um, and also, you know, to give myself a deadline to finish things. Uh, as far as this particular talk was concerned, uh, you know, I, I gave a, a, a version of it from notes um, at, at a symposium that I had organized. The symposium is part of a series called Literary Activism, not activism in the usual sense. So. Um, and uh, it, the, the theme was on not mentioning the modern, and this, um, uh, this uh, lecture was written uh, or kind of conceived uh, of for that symposium on not mentioning the modern uh, by which I meant, um, I was thinking of a particular sort of experience I'd had um, when we were, uh, when we'd been invited by the British Council, I think, to the South Bank Centre in London and a group of us were sitting together and there was some kind of um, attempt at simulating brainstorming going on and uh, we were asked to come up with ideas for future symposiums and, and conferences, etc. Of course, none of us were really interested. But I remember mentioning the modern, you know, and, and, and one, one person who's quite a well-known academic in India sort of seemed to jump up in discomfort I said, no, no, not the modern. So uh, I, I've always wondered about that, uh, that, that, that discomfiture with that word. Uh, so um, that's how it uh, sort of came to be in this, this talk. Um, and uh, giving it here means that I've now written it up. And having written it up, I find that it's quite long. So I'll, I'll try to read the entire thing for you, but um, if I see that I'm sort of, you know, taking too long, then uh, I'll begin to paraphrase, uh, which is something I don't want to do. Um, I begin by, so I'm giving you a sense of uh, how it goes, so that you know that, you know, like with the rag, the khayal, you know, you're wondering when is, he going to come to Pancham, is he going to come to Dhaibat? Okay, if he's come to Dhaibat, then you're not far from the end. So in that sense, I'll give you a kind of quick sense of the movements. I begin with an essay by Sart, and then I go on to speak about um, the emergence of uh, you know, the liberal self in India. And from there, I go on to talk about um, in the 1860s the emergence of literature um, as an imaginative sphere. And finally, I go on to the bit about Premchand. So now you know what the sections are. So once I hit the bit about uh, Tagore and the, you know, the, the imaginative sphere, the invisible modernity. Or modernism, then, then you know that I'm, I'm heading towards Premchan. Once I'm heading towards Premchan, you know that he's come towards Nishan, he's almost done. You know. um, so, anyway, uh, let me try and read out the thing. There's a sense today that Indian writing in the Indian languages has become largely invisible. This is uh, true not only of the Indian languages, though, it's true of all languages, including European ones, except English. What's become invisible or inaudible are not just the delineations, the voices of different forms of authenticity. It's the modernist avant-garde argumentations that say Urdu fiction or Bengali or German poetry are in their different ways embodiments of. We no longer have a living sense of the forms of thinking that French, Bengali or Kannada writing comprise. Translation or the availability of a German or Tamil novelist in the English language sphere has with globalization tended to become a form of gentrification. 
To read Proust now is to participate in the gentrifying process as much as visiting a particular neighborhood or drinking a particular kind of coffee is. Translation seldom any longer opens anything up. I think of invisibility as one of the manifestations of freedom. But to do this, I have to refer to the history of the invisibility of a great deal of literary and modernist practice, including practices here in India. I have to distinguish the invisibility I'm invoking from invisibility in the time of free market globalization, which is not so much a different form of existence as the equivalent of non-existence. To be, today to be visible is to exist. In the early 1900s, a paradox was available to the artist. They could, in some ways, begin to exist through invisibility. This paradox is unavailable to us now. So I'm not comparing the invisibility or non-existence conferred by globalization on, say, non-anglophone literatures with the domain of invisibility as a place of play and creativity in the time of modernity. The time of modernity is, of course, also the time of colonialism and empire, the time of the occupation of one country by another. The response to occupation is resistance, certainly, but another response, borne out by examining our literary and artistic works from the 19th century onwards, is play. The fact that this might be a possibility is, is put forward by Jean-Paul Sartre in relation to life in Nazi-occupied Paris, in a short essay he wrote for the Atlantic towards the end of the war in 1944. The terms he uses are freedom as well as resistance. Yet there's something about his provocative use of the first word that asks us to think of freedom not simply as a goal you achieve through resistance, but to imagine it in its implicit interchangeability with play as a form of resistance itself. Quote, never were we freer than under the German occupation, he says. And I continue with the quote. We had lost all our rights and first of all our right to speak. They insulted us to our faces every day and we had to hold our tongues. They deported us en masse as workers, as Jews, as political prisoners. Everywhere, upon the walls, in the press, on the screen, we found that filthy and insipid image of ourselves, which the oppressor wished to present to us. And because of all of this, we were free. I'm not setting up a literal correspondence here between Nazi occupation and colonial rule in India. I'm drawing attention to Sartre's portrayal of the vanquished, who are immediately recognizable to their oppressors for being what they are, and also to the transition that, in Sartre's account, the vanquished make towards the invisibility, in this case their invisibility as human beings, that grants them this curious freedom a stepping outside of the oppressors and even one's own parameters of thought in a way that might only be called, in spite of the dreadful circumstances of the occupation, playful. There are many sentences in Sartre's short essay I return to. For instance, quote, the more the Nazi venom crept into our thoughts, the more each precise thought became a conquest, end quote. I like this idea that precision involves the conquest of a force that intends to master us, whether that force comes from outside us or within. It recognizes that mastery depends on generalization and abstraction. I also respond to the notion that precision is a hidden, I won't use the word inward, response to generalization. Secrecy gives each precise thought not only strength, but since it's hidden, playfulness. Play and the quest for precision converge when faced with the oppressor. And given that precision is a characteristic of modernism, 
One might say that Sartre's statement gives a hint here, perhaps an inadvertent one, that the modern is a domain of freedom. The quote, secret of a man, says Sartre, is in his power to resist suffering to the point of death, end quote. If it's a secret, then it is, for the most part, like the imagination, unexhibited. Again, Sartre creates an unlooked for, maybe an inappropriate connection with play. Quote, and that is why the resistance was a true democracy. For the soldier, as for his superior, the same danger, the same loneliness, the same responsibility, the same absolute freedom within the discipline, end quote. Sartre is speaking in terms of musical improvisation, quote, the same absolute freedom within the discipline, end quote. One recalls then Rockenthal's continual crises in Sartre's 1938 novel, Nausea, crises only resolved momentarily and slightly unconvincingly by the experience of listening to a jazz record in a cafe, the voice of the negress, the narrator's word, suggesting that it's possible to be washed clean of the sin of existing. The fact that it's jazz and a black person singing is prescient of the notion that a people at once visible and invisible might also be free. But it would take the war for Sartre to translate himself from Rokhanta, the anguished listener, to the potential of being the Negress. In his essay in the Atlantic, Sartre elaborates on the possessors of the secret, that is, on all who practice, quote, the same absolute freedom within the discipline, end quote. And then quote again, thus in blood and shadows, he says, a republic erected itself, the strongest of republics. Each of its citizens knew what he owed to every other and that each could count on that alone. Each of them understood in the completest loneliness his historic role and responsibility. Each of them set themselves freely, irremediably against the oppressors. And in his freedom in choosing himself, he chose the freedom of all. This republic, without institutions, army or police, made every Frenchman affirm and maintain it against Nazism at every moment." End quote. As with Sartre's use of the word free, the word citizens too is curious and in its way liberating. What kind of citizenry can the defeated comprise? Sartre is, among other things, setting up a renovating, ironic correspondence with a dead idea the Republic of Letters, except that Sartre's Republic has no figureheads and is unconstrained by contradictions between secrecy and community, private and public. It is powerful in its lack of power, its absence of institutions, army or police. It's a play republic with play citizens and simultaneously it's a republic of play. I'll return to Sartre's observations later in my attempt to plot a course for modernity and modernism. I don't say Indian modernity or Indian modernism because I'm not, I'm not persuaded by these categories. Variants of modernism based on identity or nationality still assume the existence of a modernism whose identity is unspoken. It's this identity that continues to exert a hold upon us and refuses to open the category up. I'm going to expand on my sense not of other modernities and modernisms, but of modernity and modernism themselves, seeking entry points into them different from the ones that were handed down to me. Modernity and modernism aren't interchangeable, we, we know that, but I do see a relationship between them. My, under, my understanding of modernity distance is, distances itself from interpretations where the term represents positively or negatively, progress and development. Modern, modernity is, for me, a peculiar intermediate, intermediary period that made it possible to celebrate the non-monumental and the incomplete. 
Between this particular modernity and modernism, there is a continuity. Modernism comprises a critique of the Enlightenment idea of progress, which a particular sense of the word modern depends on so centrally. So what I'm saying is that the modern is based upon one interpretation of the modern. Is that it's the latest thing. It's, it's, it's the result of progress. Not to be modern is to be out of date. But I'm also looking at uh, modernism and to a certain extent a certain aspect of modernity as being a critique of, of, of this idea and an epoch in which this uh, critique takes place. Um, it arrives at its critique not by positing a golden age from the past against the present, but by holding up the significance of the incomplete, the slow and the non-representational. Modernism then is a contemplative rather than a nostalgic term. I wish to look primarily at two meanings latent in modern and its competing conjugations, modernize and modernist. The first to do with development and the second with the incomplete. My aim is to explore them in the context of India, my entry point here. I recall eavesdropping on a recent online talk by Dipesh Chakraborty on the emergence of modernity in Bengal, which included a fascinating account of the scholar Shignath Shastri's correspondence in the late 19th century on the matter of his relationship with and belief in God. Shastri was born in 1847 and died in 1919. In the delineation of this relationship, Chakraborty could see Shivnath Shastri's presence as a modern becoming clearer. That is, a growing inwardness characterized Shastri's assessment of the relationship with God, and with inwardness came the marks of individualism. One might hazard a guess that historians, Indian historians included, make the history of the modern concomitant with the history of individualism. The arrival of modernity coincides with the arrival of the individual. The emergence of individuality is of course viewed as a development, an irrevocable movement forward, whatever the losses of being an individual might entail. The Shivnath Shastri moment is, in a sense, a rehearsal of the leap Christopher Bailey says Ramohan Roy made in the late 18th century, from being an administrative assistant and scholar to becoming India's first liberal. That leap, too, was accompanied by the establishment of the idea of one God and the possibility of having a relationship with him. Roy, we are told by all accounts, including the ones taught in school, recovers Hindu Hinduism's God through the Upanishads. A God with a capital G. The Upanishadic turn is portrayed as a turn towards monotheism. This is still more or less taken as a given. The creation of the Brahmo Samaj in 1828 stands for the formalization of this position, the founding of a reformist worldview that frees itself from polytheism through the re-articulation of an ancient native lineage of monotheism. Why is the turn towards monotheism crucial in the history of modernity? Does its importance have to do with proving to the colonizers that Indians had a counterpart to the European Protestant and Unitarian traditions? Partly it was related to the fact that monotheism was seen as an improvement over polytheism and its embarrassing cacophony. Of course, the notion of monotheism being the correct religious alternative goes back to Christianity and Islam and their disdain for idol worship. But Islam and Hinduism coexisted in, in, in India without this question of gods versus God ever becoming anything other than a continual if deep rift in a worldview. A rift on whose either side one could set up house. It's only with Ram Mohan that monotheism takes a new resonance points to the coming into existence of a new class of Indians and becomes a founding moment in the history of the liberal. The turn to monotheism is all important to this narrative of modernity because the existence of one God increasingly implies 
the existence of the individual for whom God is meaningful. By contrast, it's assumed that the array of deities that comprise polytheism are hosted and supplicated to by a community. God, on the other hand, as we see with Shivnath Shastri, himself a leading Brahmo half a century after Ramuhan, is a private matter. In this formation of the individual, in the, tra in the trajectory of Indian liberalism, the Cartesian formulation is, is rewritten as I think of God, therefore I am. You can't think of gods, you can only live with them. The polytheistic world is too undifferentiated from ourselves. That is the assumption. In the prehistory of the founding of the Brahmo Shamaj and the inauguration of a liberal ethos, we must place the publication of the English translation of the Bhagavad Gita by Charles Wilkins in 1785, particularly because it catches Warren Hastings' attention as a Unitarian text. He's drawn to the Gita because he sees in it a version of Unitarianism. Here possibly begins the myth of Indian monotheism, as well as part of the catalyzing process leading to the advent of individual of the individual and then of the liberal. Unitarianism disagrees with the idea of the Holy Trinity, the Father, Son and Holy Spirit, arguing for there being only one God, making him a matter of individual faith. The beginnings of the rejection of the idea of the Trinity in the 17th century are seen by advocates of the Trinity or Trinitarians as being rationalist, in that it involves a rejection of the numinous. Ramon Roy was himself close to Unitarianism and dismissed the possibility of Christian miracles on the grounds of a rationality that partly derived from the Enlightenment, partly from Islamic traditions, and partly surely given his affinities from Unitarianism, which with its insistence that Jesus was not God, but a great man, distances itself from the notion of the Immaculate Conception and other miracles. Hastings and later Roy's readings or misreadings of the Gita and Upanishads as proto-Unitarian works need to be included in this mapping of a history of liberalism in India. These texts, the Gita and Upanishads, are still to be found today in the location once created for them by Indology and Oriental studies. As forms of scripture or religious teaching or receptacles of the wisdom of the East. Yet even Indologists would have sensed something about them that was not in a Judeo-Christian sense, religious or even theistic. In 1950, Raymond Schwab writes retrospectively in La Renaissance Orientale that, quote, in 1759, Anquetal, meaning Anquetal Duperon, uh, finished his translation of the Avesta at Surat, in, 19, in 1786, that of the Upanishads in Paris, he had dug a channel between the hemispheres of human genius, correcting and expanding the old humanism of the Mediterranean basin." End quote. From Raymond Schwab. The key word here is humanism. The key phrase, correcting and expanding. Schwab doesn't see the translation of the Upanishads as an addition to our storehouse of religious belief, he places it in a widening of our understanding of the history of humanism. He is responding to the non-theistic nature of the text, probably. He is also, without perhaps realizing it, referring to the subconscious transformation that the Upanishads went through as a monotheistic text in its contribution to and in the course of the founding of liberalism in India. Are the Upanishads monotheistic? I don't think so. Both the Upanishads and the Gita formulate radical non-binary interventions, as does Buddhism. They are among the earliest and still most compelling forms of non-binary critical thinking. They involve experiments with thought that lie outside the mainstream in our culture nor do they adhere to the Judeo-Christian binary of an overseeing God in control of creation, a powerful, omniscient, 
omnipresent being that man looks up to. The notion of Brahman, which means neither Brahmin nor the god Brahma, is a non-binary concept rather than a monotheistic god. This means unlike God, Brahman is neither one thing nor another. Quote, he is near and he is far. And Brahman is, unlike God, both present and absent. Quote, what the eye cannot see, but whereby the eye can see, what the tongue cannot taste, but whereby the tongue can taste. End quote. This is not God, but a conceptual challenge. Rasa theorists like Bhattanayak and Abhinavagupta in the 9th and 10th centuries, respectively, suggest that it is possible to taste Brahman, taste Brahman, not with the tongue but through rasa. Quote, the taste of rasa is akin to the savouring of Brahman. End quote. This comment from Bhattanayak is a reminder that Brahman can be savoured through the release from conceptual parameters that rasa involves, so that an experience that doesn't entail direct physical contact, such as watching a play, accessing Brahman, becomes a physical one, savoury or asvara. Brahman then is at odds with the way we conceive of God and our relationship with him. The Upanishads as a resource for monotheism is a misreading necessary for the starting point of liberalism in India. The monotheistic temper becomes fundamental to the progressive ethos of the Indian liberal. The casting off of the entanglements of the polytheistic universe, its irrational beliefs, not so much miracles where Hinduism is concerned, but rituals and superstitions, leading to a vanguard responding to polytheisms or India's continual need for reform. In this way, with the creation of the progressive, a hegemony comes into being, a class that shapes and decides values. Monotheism had, for instance, been adhered to by Muslim rulers, but the monotheistic beliefs of the political dispensation didn't engender a hegemony. At some point, Islam suddenly became a resource alongside the Upanishads and Unitarianism for Ramman's monotheism in the early 1800s. The liberal hegemony in India emerges around this time, also the time, as it happens, of the growing colonial dominance of the East India Company, and is never subsequently coterminous or synonymous with the political dispensation in power in the country except maybe in the 50 years of the so-called Nehruvian epoch. The first half of the 19th century is also when the, liberal, when the liberal Indian seems to start to identify themselves as citizen rather than subject. The tone of the early to mid 19th century liberal is not of the subject but of the progressive. A transition of power is being made at this time, not only from local and pan-Indian aristocracies to the East India Company and then in 1858 to the Crown. But from those aristocracies and their worlds of rulers and subjects and their disparate religious universes to the moral ethos of the liberal Indian proto-citizen. Even with the advent of formalized British rule under the Crown, this class remains the hegemony a hegemony constituted of citizens rather than either subjects or, for that matter, political rulers. These are citizens, partly in Sartre's sense, without, quote, institutions, army or police. The British themselves never form a hegemony in India. They are apparatchiks of empire, the custodians of institutions, army and police. At worst, they are, in Sartre's vocabulary, oppressors. At best, they enter the peripheries of the hegemony through friendships with figures in that liberal history. Even what we think of Western literature and culture comes to us more, I think, through the mediation of this hegemony than merely by dissemination through the colonial apparatus of education. 
But the liberal hegemony is not entirely a make-believe or secret citizenry because it does, with the founding of the Hindu College in Calcutta in 1817, begin to enter, then shape institutions. Yet part of the shaping, as with Henry Louis Vivian de Rosio's allegedly anti-religion lectures for which he had to resign from his job, or with the poet Michael Modushutan Dutt's resistant presence in the college, he was expelled for converting to Christianity, could be conceived in its eccentricity as play. Invisibility begins after 1857 to 1858, the years of the first war of independence or mutiny and the punitive reprisals, the end of East India Company rule and India's formal annexation to the British Empire. There had been free mixing between races in cities like Calcutta in the early 19th century. Now, as noted by almost all commentators, there was polarization. The amended 1884 Ilbert Bill, which prevented Indian magistrates from presiding over cases in which the British were being tried, deepened the polarization. For the English, India became the Raj. For Indians, this is the period when the liberal modernity that emerged in the early 19th century begins to critique itself. The critique takes on the form of play. Kipling, born in 1865 in Bombay, is born into the Raj, that is an India of institutions, army or police, where natives exist as subjects but where liberal modernity is invisible. Kipling's landscape, once he starts writing in the 1880s, is populated with increasingly talking uh, monkeys, bears, snakes and tigers. There is no sign of, in it of the modern. The irrepressible talking animals hint at a contemporaneous cultural play that's never openly acknowledged. What happens in the invisible domain of modernity? Three years after the crown takes over from the East India Company and four years after Kipling is born, what is possibly the first modernist text is composed and published under a pseudonym in Calcutta in 1861, Hutum Pacham Noksha, or the Night Owl Sketches, published in the style of the scurrilous pamphlets of the Bortpala Press, ostensibly meant to be like these pamphlets, a satirical record of, record of lo local gossip written with uh, Dickens's journalistic vignettes of London, uh, sketches by Boz in mind, this unruly text by the 24-year-old Kaliprashan Nashingho is one of the earliest instances of disjunctive transitions in prose based often on sensory and involuntary compulsions. Here are some sentences that presage in their swagger and vulnerability the prose poetry of another young man, Rambo, 11 years later. And I quote. I quote from her. Hutam was Pachanoksha in Chitraleka Basu's translation. Even as a child, I was precocious. When I left school, the precocity spilled over like starch from a pot of boiling rice. I guess readers would be able to gauge the extent of my precocity in these sketches by Hutam. It, is, it assumed monstrous proportions. Certain people started calling me a clever bugger out of affection. As a child, I had a high regard for the Bengali language and was not averse to learning it. My aged grandmother would tell me folk tales before I went to sleep. She would recite verses by Kobi Kankan, Mukundaram, Kriptibash and Kashidash from memory. I too learned them by heart and would recite the verses at school, at home and to my mother who would be very pleased and sometimes give me a sweet for each couplet. As a child, I believed that eating too many sweets could give you a stammer. So I had some and scattered the rest on the terrace for crows and pigeons to feed on. We had a nice cat called Munjuri. Poor thing, she died yesterday morning and hasn't left any young ones. She would have the rest. This then is both a, quote, prodigious psychological biography. I mean, this, this, it doesn't continue in this way. This is just an inter interjection in the midst of various other kind of vignettes. Uh, prodigious psychological biography. It is Verlaine's description of Rambo's uh, A Season in Hell and the record of a race. But unlike anything an Indian liberal could have written at that point, and unlike anything available then in England, this is one of the early events in this teeming invisible world. What other occurrences can you situate in the beginnings of this invisibility? There is the first modern Bengali poet Michael Modushudan Dutt's Bangla appropriation of the Petrarchan sonnet, 
whether appropriation involves a recontextualizing of what already had become an outmoded for form in English, an equation for parodying Bengali devotional language and accommodate, accommodating passionate outbursts and deep personal memory. In other words, the creation of a found object. What I'm saying is that he treats the sonnet as a found object, as a bit of thing to play around with. Found object is from Marcel Duchamp. His idea that we, we use odds and ends, which at, at a certain point recontext, recontextualize, become art objects. But before he starts writing sonnets, there are other appropriations by that. Principally, his writing of a modern mock epic in 1859 to 60, Meghna Bodhokapu, the poem of the slaying of Meghna, in which an episode from the Ramayana leads to an overturning of the epic, and the son of Ram's adversary, Ravan, Meghna, becomes the tragic hero. Michael had, until 1858, been an English poet. His turn to Bengali is no simple response to the crown. Overtly, it has nothing to do with the political transition. Yet, coincidentally, it marks the establishment of a domain of freedom that is also to be invisible. The idea of the traditional villain becoming the hero arises for that from the compelling example of Satan in Paradise Lost and from Blake's insight. Milton was of the devil's party without knowing it. That is, Milton, according to Blake, had set out to justify the ways of God to men in his poem, but his imaginative energies had embraced the figure of Satan instead. Blake put this in terms of enchainment and freedom. Quote, Milton wrote in fetters when he wrote of angels and God, and at liberty when of devils and hell. That saw the creative potential of Milton's unintended positioning and of Blake's insight and embarked on his own project of rewriting and liberation. His relationship with world literature, world literature was not one of a writer who saw tradition as a static historical entity at different points during the composition. It seems he inhabited not only different bits of the world but different points in history, losing in the process a reliable Bengali self. Quote, I shall not borrow Greek stories, but write, rather try to write, as a Greek would have done." End quote. He says in a letter to his friend Raj Narayan in 1860, Rather than study the ancient Greeks, that resolves to become, for a while, an ancient Greek. In the way that Tagore, after staying in a Mughal palace in Gujarat, conceived of the character of Srijut in Khudito Pashan, the Hungry Stones in 1895, a colonial tax collector by day who finds himself succumbing to a metamorphosis of self by night. Quote, I would then be transformed into some unknown personage of a bygone age, playing my part in unwritten history, and my short English coat and tight breeches did not suit me in the least. With a red velvet cap on my head, loose pajamas and embroidered vest, a long flowing silk gown and colored handkerchief, handkerchief scented with other, I would complete my elaborate toilet, sit on a high cushioned chair and replace my cigarette with a many coiled nargila filled with rose water as if in eager expectation of a strange meeting with the beloved one. End quote. These instances of play run counter to both the progressives and the colonizers conception of history's unfolding. Tagore is born in the year of Dutt's poem and Hutum's appearance, 1861, into this invisible modernity. I reiterate that post-1858 polarization leads to the British losing sight of and missing this modernity and specifically remain unaware of its countercultural modernism. That particular losing sight of is our inheritance as Anglophone Indians and also for much of the rest of the world. In the meantime, from the 1860s, the invisibility creates a sphere of freedom that is different from, though not incompatible with, the ambition of political independence. 
When Tagore writes his first short story, The Postmaster, in 1891, his narrator is someone for whom the colonizer is already a momentary presence that can be encapsulated in the third sentence and never referred to again in the course of the story. I quote, as soon as he took up employment, the postmaster found himself stationed at Ulapur. It was a village of no consequence. There was an indigo planter's home nearby and the Sahib had made every effort to get a post office established in the environs." End quote. Each of the opening sentences records an accident or contingency. The postmaster's posting in Ulapur, the fact that Ulapur is a place of no consequence, the setting up of the post office by the indigo planter, all of these putting into motion the contingency, the redundancy of the story itself. None of this need have happened, we are being told. The story preoccupies, preoccupies the writer precisely for this reason. The fact that such wayward, wayward non-instrumentality unsettles Bhadralok expectations. The word Bhadralok is indeed used by Tagore in the story. It must be one of the first times it occurs in a literary work is captured by the postmaster's puzzlement over his posting. The phrase, a village of no consequence, defines the domain of invisibility, not just the village, but the Indian modern. Though the postmaster feels entrapped, the narrator's imagination is curiously freed up. This third sentence, where the first and last mention of the indigo planter occurs, reveals that invisibility is a two-way process. If this modernity is invisible to the colonizer, it in turn confers invisibility on the colonizer. It also tells us that the critique this invisible modernism formulates is not primarily aimed then at the colonizer. It is directed at the liberal hegemony from which the narrative has emerged and like the postmaster fallen off from. The rest of the story is about the postmaster's short-lived mentorship of Ratan, the 11-year-old servant girl and her ministering to the postmaster. Early on, there's a pre-Proustian Proustian moment, worth quoting, for the way it diverges from historiographical accounts of time. Quote, she would recall she had a younger brother. This is Ratan. She would recall she had a younger brother. On a monsoon day years ago, they had stood by a pool and pretending a broken branch was a fishing rod played at a make-believe game of catching fish. This memory came back to her more frequently than more important events." End quote. Notice, notice the widening out of, the, of time in the sentence so that an interregnum in an 11-year-old's life seems to resemble the expansion of a historical epoch. Notice too how memory and play diminish the significance ascribed to the historical. This memory came back to her more frequently than more important events. The sentence contains a moment of creative self-awareness while comprising in its belief that tele teleology, unimportant, uh, teleology important events diverges from the truth of how we experience the world, a gentle rebuff of the milieu Tagore had grown up in. Tagore's father was close to Ram Mohan, yet his approach to his subject matter in the story is not reformist in the way it could and many, way, and many would say should have been. It is contemplative. If the individual emerges in Bengal with that class for whom the representative figures here are Ramon Rai and also fundamentally his friend Darukanath Tagore, um, Rabindranath's grandfather and later Shivnath Shastri, defined at first by man's relationship with God, then it's this post-1828 unitary sense of self that the modernism of Rabindranath Tagore say that the period of invisibility dismantles. The sense of self is fundamental to the liberal hegemony and its commitment to the march of capital and progress and reform. It's making available the possibility of being citizens rather than subjects, of belonging to a republic even when one is being ruled by the crown. Since its sense of self comes to form a hegemony, the post-1858 play of modernism 
which arises precisely within and from that milieu must tear it down. The tearing down happens to be concomitant with the turn towards and rise of the literatures in, English, in, in Indian languages. These become the anti-hegemonic sphere of play. The fact that they neither have to engage with the colonizer nor represent the nation both renders them invisible and frees them up. There are multiple fragmentary projects characterized by what Mrinal Pandey in her ob obituary on Nirmal Verma called, describing Hindi literature, reckless abandon. As this domain begins to become Sorry, as this domain begins to come into being in the late 19th century, these writers often remain political by day, that is nationalistic and anti-colonial, and anti-hegemonic in the nighttime of their creativity. Their concern as, as experimenters is not to attack the empire, they simply de-recognize its existence, as in the opening of the postmaster. They wish to attack the hegemony, the investments of the Shibnath Shastri self, some of the resources that play a key part in the attack are the same texts that help form the liberal hegemony, the Gita and the Upanishads. These works are no longer subjected to a unitarian reading and valued for their espousal of monotheism. They are looked to by Tagore and others, including a number of European romantics and later modernists, for for providing a non-binary language that undermines the idea of one overseeing God, a definition of action as contemplation and a way of valuing the experience of stasis of the meaning and energy of non-movement in Kant's words arrived at five years after Charles Wilkins's translation of the Gita, purposeless purposiveness. This non-monotheistic Poetic reading runs counter to the liberal hegemony's investment in India in forward movement. Buddhism's critique of the unitary self, anatta, literally non-self, would have been important to Tagore too. Consigned since the early 19th century to Indology and the Orient, these texts and worldviews help at the outset transform literature in India as it did elsewhere for Kant, for Kant Matthew Arnold and Eliot into an ex eccentric mode of experience and valuation, a form of freedom that fits awkwardly with the liberal vision. Here then we have yet another republic comprising a different kind of citizen without institutions, army or police or perhaps a model for the anti-citizen, a type that is neither citizen nor subject, but without whom the definition of freedom remains incomplete. Let me try to briefly record a few moments that represent the journey of the Upanishads and Gita from being Indian modernity's late 18th century Unitarian texts to a key resource for modernism's interest in art as thought and thought as art. In the prehistory of this journey lies Devendranath's accidental encounter in 1843 at the time of his mother's death with some pages from the Upanishads and the fact that he is struck by this line. Ananda Rup Amritam Jad Vibhati or that which is expressed in the elixir Amritam of joy, Ananda. The attention Devendranath gives to these words creates a realignment. The text shifts unobtrusively from being a source for a creator god to one that con contains a conceptual intervention, a reminder that Brahma is not a god, indeed no such equivalence is made in the text, but a non-instrumental experience of joy. This word Ananda would be key to Devendranath's son, Rabindranath, in his quest to formulate the literary as a form of thought at once atheistic, that is largely devoid of devotional and religious markers, and joyous. The Upanishads and Gita begin in the Brahma Shamaja's Unitarian type monotheism and also become appropriated and curtailed, curtailed by Indology and Oriental studies. Their li liberatory impact occurs in facilitating the form of thinking we call modernism. Devendranath's encounter with Ananda at paradoxically the time of his mother's death and significance to his son are coordinates in the domain of play. A year later, in England, Matthew Arnold 
starts to read the Gita and notes shrewdly Krishna's advocacy to Arjun to not relinquish action but its outcome. The binary conception of action opposes it to inaction. The hermit withdraws from the sphere of action to become a renunciate. Anand notices, as he writes in a letter nine years later to the poet Arthur Hugh Clough, that the Gita takes us out of this opposition to act in a way where the work is a form of absorption rather than directed towards an outcome is to make withdrawal unnecessary and action non-linear. It is to create a new kind of act. An act that goes nowhere is difficult to grasp intellectually and Arnold realizes its significance to a new conception of poetry and criticism as forms of absorption of stasis since the act is undertaken without thought of outcome rather than involving the instrumental actions that define other spheres of post-enlightenment knowledge. I mentioned Arnold to point to the journey these Indian texts are making across time, the late 18th, the 19th and then the 20th centuries and space, India and Europe, as they move through a conceptual translation towards definition of literary thought. What then of the unitary self of the Enlightenment or the self of, in Shibnath Shastri's words, the Nobu Jagaron or the New Awakening? Tagore's poetry, given his exposure to Buddhism and the Upanishads, starts dismantling it. There are two birds, I quote, there are two birds, two sweet birds who dwell on the self-same branch, says the Mundaka Upanishad. The one eats the fruit thereof, the other looks on in silence. And the, in the famous Tatvam Asi says Uddala cryptically to his son in the Chandokya Upanishad, or implausibly, you are that. If Uddala means I am Brahman, then I, the cherished eye of human consciousness, of the enlightenment, the progenitor of liberal knowledge, cannot be I. Tagore presumably has this in mind while inviting his friend Priyanath Shen to his wedding in 1883. Quote, Priya Babu, on the auspicious day of the coming Sunday of 24th Agrayan, November, December, my close relative Sriman Rabindranath will be married at an auspicious hour. We would be grateful if you could join us on that occasion in the evening at number 6 Jorajhako at Devendranath Thakur's house to participate in the wedding celebrations. Yours sincerely, Sri Rabindranath Thakur. End quote. In 1941, Tagore resurrects this odd syntax when describing in a letter to the poet Buddhadeva Bosch the quote, inaugural moments of my poetical career and refers to the sense of transfiguration he had in Jorajhako as a boy when he saw a cow nicking a donkey. Quote, in the entire history of that day, it was Rabindranath alone who witnessed the scene with enchanted eyes. No one else was instructed by the history of that day in the profound, profound significance of the site, as was Rabindranath. End quote. Tagore wrote this two weeks before his death, expressing a difference of opinion with Bose about what one might call the liberal hegemonist privilege of history. That is, the idea of de development from past to present. Quote, I've heard it said again and again that we are guided altogether by history. I've settled this debate in my own heart where I'm nothing but a poet. I find it difficult to put up with a pedantic historian. I have it in mind to say, off with your history. Dur hog ge tomar itihash. End quote. In, in the course of this letter, Tagore invokes Buddhism and the Upanishads, but her eyes naturally glaze over these acknowledgements on a first reading. We miss their capacity as formative and subversive conceptual resources as we miss the irony of their chameleon-like transformation, their key role in the creation of liberal modernity, monotheism, and later in the 19th century, their part in modernism's critique of that liberal modernity. That critique was emerging across geographies tapping into the same set of concepts. Here is Rango, the, uh, the French poet, in a letter to Georges uh, Isambard in 1871, by when the Upanishads, courtesy Abraham Hyacinth, Akita Duparam's translations had been in circulation in France for over a century. Quote, I want to be a poet and I'm working to make myself a seer. You will not understand this and I don't know how to explain it to you, 
It is a question of reaching the unknown by the derangement of all the senses. The sufferings are enormous, but one has to be strong to be born a poet. And I know I'm a poet. This is not my fault. It is wrong to say, I think. One ought to say, people think of me. Pardon the pun. See, puns on pons there to think and pons there to groom. I is someone else. What is this unknown that Rambo refers to? It's not God. It's not quite the self either. I is someone else. I is another. Something else has taken their place. If it's arrived at by derangement of the senses, this derangement is not caused by trauma, as canonical readings of European modernism would have it, but by conceptual unsettlement. The unsettlement annuls Cartesianism. I quote, it is wrong to say, I think, one ought to say, people think of me, end quote. And despite its sufferings, it is exuberant and enunciatory, as another letter from 1871 written to Paul Demeni demonstrates. And I quote again from Rambo, I is another. If the brass wakes the trumpet, it's not its fault. That's obvious to me. I witness the unfolding of my own thought. I watch it, I hear it, I make a stroke with the bow. The symphony begins in the depths or springs with a bound onto the stage. If the old imbeciles hadn't discovered only the false significance of the self, we wouldn't have to now sweep away those millions of skeletons which have been piling up the products of their one-eyed intellect since time immemorial and claiming themselves to be their authors." End quote. Almost a hundred years later, in 1960, the narrator of the page-long Borges and I remarks, the other one, the one called Borges, is the one things happen to. I do not know which of us has written this page. End quote. This note of se separation between what Eliot called the self that suffers and the mind that creates entered what we call popular culture too, when Poirot is asked irritably during his penultimate case, why he always speaks of himself in the third person, he replies unruffled, because I observe myself. If Shibla Shastri's sense of self in the 1880s is a marker of liberal modernity in India, then we also have in another sphere in that modernity that self being arraigned. As in Tagore's 1894 essay, Chele Bhulana Chara, rhymes to entrance children, with this articulation of the notion of stream of consciousness. And this is the first time that stream of consciousness is entering the literary domain. I mean, it's been it's been there before in philosophy, William James, uh, 1890, 1891, and this is 1894. It's the first time it's coming into literature. So I quote from Tagore, where he's uh, speaking about a few things, uh, to which he then connects uh, the, 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 the nursery rhymes and stream of consciousness. So Tagore says, when one starts to think objectively with a specific objective in view, One's intellect and imagination take on an integrated purpose and begin to flow in a single direction. The substance one calls one's mind is so authoritarian that when it awakens and emerges into the light of day, the greater part of the world within and outside us is obscured under its influences. Think about it, the call of birds in the sky, the sough of leaves, the babble of waters, the hubbub of human habitations, so many thousands of sounds, big and small, rising without end, so many waves and tremors, comings and goings, yet only a small fraction of all this impinges on one's consciousness. This is chiefly because one's mind, like a fisherman, casts a net of integration and accepts only what it can gather at a single haul. Everything else eludes it. It has the power to move all irrelevancies far away from the path of its set purpose." End quote. One's intellect and imagination, one's mind is so authoritarian. These phrases are euphemisms for the Shibnath Shastri self, at once foundational, progressive, and full of an integrated purpose. And the reminders of Tagore's and the various Indian literature's critical angularity to, even hostility to, towards, the liberal hegemony from which they both arise and dissent against. Against this authoritarian hegemony, Tagore posits something he came, claims to find in Bengali children's rhymes, a sense of nitto prabahito chetana, a, a quote, constant flow of consciousness. 
that like a stream won't filter out detritus or what the adult mind deems irrelevant and superfluous. The superfluous, anavashyak, anavashyak, is of fundamental polemical importance. It contributes to positioning literature, literature as an anti-hegemonic rather than anti-colonial argument. This doesn't mean that these writers aren't this doesn't mean that these writers are anti-progressive or anti-liberal. As I've said, most of them are progressive by day. At night, however, they turn upon themselves. I is another. This turn takes place in a time of empire, in a very different way from what nationalism could conceive of. It hints at the fact that during this period, quote, we were at our most free. Since the model for literature as a form of thought, rather than merely being uh, a carrier of thoughts and ideas, springs, I think, from the encounter with non-theistic texts like the Upanishads and Gita and movements like Buddhism. That modernism becomes itself a mode of atheistic absorption, of atheistic wonder. It gives us a variety of secular experience that the liberal hegemony can't. I've come to the last bit, and I know, you know, I've reached the, the can is going on for a very long time. But anyway, um, this is the last bit. Um, a few months ago, uh, I discussed a couple of stories by Premchand with my students, Shatranj K. Khilari, or the chess players from 1924, and Bare Bhai Sahib, older brother, from 10 years later. Premchand, as most of us know, wrote in both Hindi and Urdu, Hindi by morning, Urdu by afternoon, he claimed. For me, these stories are felt remarkable as I reread them for being situated in the history I've just outlined, for the interface in, in them between the progressive worldview and the anti-hegemonic impulse. Premchand was, of course, a leading light of the Progressive Writers Association. Even if we weren't aware of this fact, we'd still associate him from our memories of stories encountered in school with a literature of activist ideals, of socialist realism, reform, and resolute excoriations towards betterment. One of my students, Shah Faisal Mushtaq, drew the class's attention in his essay to Premchand's speech in Urdu at the inaugural meeting of the All India Progressive Writers Association in Lucknow on 9th to 10th April 1936. Discovering it inflected his reading of Shatranj Ke Khilari. Premchand argued in his speech that classical Urdu writing and poetry were passive, fantastical, and non realistic. He wanted literature to reflect and represent reality. Now, a quote from Faisal's essay, literature contains a narrative of the real, and he's quoting Premchand, expressed through a concrete and pure language, that is, Faisal points out the language of the masses. Literature is best defined as a critique to do with reality in the form of dialogue, short stories, or poetry. End quote. Art needs to benefit people, says Premchand. He Quote, values art based on its utility. And then there is an entire quote, uh, which Adib, your artist, Taban, or, or whatever. So I'll just read the translation. In Faisal's translation, a writer or an artist is progressive in their essence. If they aren't, they are not artists. They work to eliminate the harmful elements of society so that the world becomes a better place. End quote. Although Prentin, Prenchand rep reprimands the Urdu poets of the past for their lack of socialist collectivism and for their individualism in Firadiyat, or what he sees as their romantic self-absorption. His own progressive position arises from a reformist self in India, which just over a century after its emergence speaks with quasi-authoritarian conviction at the Progressive Writers Association meeting. In the chess players, this tone is mimicked in the opening paragraphs, a tone echoing the impatience of Indian nationalist historians with their country's self-divided past, as well as imperial histories on India's fatal decadence in the last years of Mughal rule. When we read the sentences closely, though, we find their structure is aphoristic. Here are the first two. Quote, it was the era of Wajid Ali Shah, Lucknow was plunged deep in luxurious living. Lucknow was plunged deep in what? The structure and phrasing lead us to expect misery or torment. But luxurious living, plunged deep in, 
Immediately in a year pixel, there's something off register here. Quote, while one might arrange parties for dancing and singing, another would find enjoyment only in the drowsy ecstasy of opium. The narrator continues. And a bit later, revisiting the structure of the second sentence, he says that, quote, bureaucrats were steeped in gross sensuality, poets in describing lovers and the sufferings of separation, artisans in creating intricate patterns of gold and silver thread, end quote. A picture begins to form made up of disparate moments that have no real equivalence or relation with each other except through this poetic yoking together of detail and superfluities. Quote, from king to beggar all was swept with the same antic spirit to the point where when beggars were given money they spent it not on bread but opium or mother. By playing chess, cards or Ganji father, wits were sharpened, the process of thought was developed, one became accustomed to solving complex problems. Arguments of this sort were presented with great vehemence. End quote. It's as if the narrator were only pretending to give us the reasons behind Lucknow's downfall. His real intention is to recover an antique history of being. The Premchand addressing the Progressive Writers Association couldn't have accounted for this aphoristic self. It undermines and transforms the progressive, somewhat paternalistic rhetoric. I find I recorded two observations on how aphorisms are arrived at in my notebook after rereading Shatranj Ke Khilari. And I'm quoting myself here. To give an untenable sentence validity through elegance and casual assertiveness. The second one, to give an absurd statement the structure of an insight and or to give a genuine insight an air of absurdity. And this, this is what the first two or three paragraphs are like. Quite in contrast to the tone and language of the Progressive Writer, Writers Association speech, where he, they seem to be saying the same thing. The same uh, note of disapproval seems to be struck. The story is about two chess enthusiasts, Mirza Sajjad Ali and Mirza Roshan Ali. Quote, masters of hereditary estates with no worry about their income, who as a result could, quote, lounge around at home enjoying their idleness. They spend their time sharpening their wits, that is, playing chess, quite unaware, quote, quite unaware of when it was noon or afternoon or evening, end quote. With Mir Sajjad, in whose house the games took place, leaving his family exasperated and helpless. One day, Meer Sajjad's bacon has a headache and sends word through a maid to her husband to go out and get her medicine. Quote, Mirzaji was immersed in a very interesting game, says the narrator. Bade dilchas babazi. She is not on her deathbed, is she? He replies, rephrasing uh, Shakespeare's She Should Have Died Hereafter and adding, can't she be just a little patient? Uh, this eventually leads to a bitter altercation between husband and wife and the friends have to change uh, venue for future games to meet Roshan Ali's house. But, quote, for some unknown reason, Meer Sahib's Begum considered it most fitting for her husband to stay far away from home, end quote. Still, Meer Sahib's drawing room became a site where, quote, newer st strategies were devised, new defenses organized and ever new battle formations planned. End quote. The Begum's own game is that she's having an affair, her lover pretending to be a soldier in the royal army and part of a contingent that seeking out Mir Roshan Ali manages to scare off the chess players. A new venue is required. I'm quoting. From the next day on, the two friends would set out from the house at the crack of dawn, carrying with them a rather small carpet and a box of prepared pan, and go to the other side of the Gomiti River to an old ruined mosque which had probably, probably been built in the time of Nova Asafadola, apart from check and checkmate, not another word came out of their mouths. No yogi could have been more profoundly plunged in trance. End quote. Now, meantime, adds the narrator, the political situation in the country was becoming desperate. The East India Company's armies were advancing on Lucknow. End quote. The game continues by the mosque, accompanied by repartee and historic Inversions. Quote, Mir Sahib said, the British army is coming, God save us. Mirza said, let them come, but now get out of check. End quote. And later, after Wajib Ali Shah is captured, quote, 
first save your own king, then you can mourn for his majesty. End quote. In the end, the friends end up attacking and mortally wounding each other after mutual allegations of cheating. The game ends, so do their lives, so does the story. Quote, silence spread over all the broken archways of the ruins, the crumbling walls and the dusty minarets looked down upon the corpses and mourned. End quote. One game leads to another. I mean Prentan's story, written when Hindi literature was no more in the sights of empire than Mirza Sajid Ali and Mir Roshan Ali were. Nor the empire any more at the core of this world than it is in Prentan's tale. The story is set in 1856. The deposing, the deposing of Wajid Ali Shah leads to the mutiny and the transfer of power to the crown. The forms of play in the story are self-reflexive invocations of forms of play to come. Prentan's story is in its way a form of play which takes on the persona of the post Ramohan progressive nationalist reformist and enacts not so much the demise of the Mughal Empire as the sly unraveling of this progressive self. Chess absorbs the chess players. Other things absorb their wives. An absorption, oblivious to the world and yet preternaturally attuned to it, absorbs the author and reader. Literature's play comprises the cherishing of, the dilchaspi for, stasis, with the players, quote, quite unaware of when it was noon or afternoon or evening, end quote. And it involves arguing for stasis and absorption being modes of energy and action while mocking that dilchaspi through the narrative voice. This absorption is at once bad and good, true and untrue, and it's this confusion of binaries that makes the story freeing and delighting. That is why we don't mourn while reading Shatranj Ke Khilari. We laugh, as we do with Kafka's stories, and feel invigorated. The conceptual shift behind the texts that lie in the history of this immersion is hinted at very quickly. No yogi could have been more profoundly plunged in trance. A reminder that the Gita, the Upanishads and Buddhist thinking transform in modernism, nothingness for Hegel, identical to the Gita's pointless nihilism, stasis and non-linearity into positive rather than negative categories. Prentian's word in the original for David Rubin's trance is Samadhi, and I composed that brief history of cultural circulation above, mainly so that we may get a sense of the kind of literary thought the word represents as well as its conceptual position. Prentian in Shatranj Ke Khilari undoes the self that will later address the Progressive Writers Association. At the PWA, he speaks as a citizen of a nation, but when Mirza Sajid says, first save your own king, then you can mourn for his majesty, yet another republic, or according to the stories, According to the story's historical moment, kingdom comes into being, a domain of play where we are either, as with the case with Lucknow in 1856, losing our institutions, police or army, or choosing to be without them. In Premchand's story, the moment of defeat is the moment of freedom. I should add a quick note on Satyajit Ray's film version of Premchand's story. For Ray's film represents its awkward transition towards fitting in with the progress, powerful new progressive hegemony in the 1970s, which the parallel cinema movement in Hindi comprised. First, it involved the shift for him to Hindi, which at this point, during the establishing of the parallel cinema that decade, no longer had the associations of invisibility that Hindi would have had in Premchand's era, whether or not Premchand acknowledged them. The parallel cinema was a progressive modulation on what was already a pan-Indian phenomenon in the cinema and an attempt to impart to that phenomenon citizenly values. To be part of this ethos, Ray had to, has to renege on the uncitizenly characteristics of his early to mid-career work, its propensity for absorption and daydreaming. In, say, the memory game, of or in Oranya Dinratri, there's no judgment of the Calcutta Bhadralok ga gathered in a forest officer's bungalow, but only a reliving during the game of moments of drift and immersion. In Shatranj Ke Khilari, Ray can't enter the spell that the errant protagonists repeatedly sur surrendered to in the same way. And unlike the short story, which right from the second sentence plunges deep into what it disproves of, the film maintains a reassuring distance from the game. 
Now the very last bit. Bade Bhai Saab. I saw a Bengali stage version of Bade Bhai Saab years ago, directed by Gautam Halda, who also played both the younger as well as the eponymous respected older brother, movingly. I never forgot that version and looked up the story for the class. It was first published in 1934, closer than Shatranj Ke Khilari Din to the PW address, PWA address. I find in it the same subtle creative journey towards play and absorption in the guise of a paternalistic address on enlightenment values to do with progress, knowledge and of course education. The person delivering this, the address is the respected older brother. The addressee is the younger one. Sadly, as well as comically, the older brother appears in the course of the story as both father and child to the narrator, the younger brother. Always respected but puzzlingly ingenuous. This is not a story about the value of betterment then, it's the story, it's a story of becoming. It begins, a quote from the story, the opening. My Bhai Sahab was older, I've taken this of a blog translation, there are some translations available on the net, I like, I quite like this translation. Uh, my Bhai Sahab uh, was older than me by five years, yet only three years ahead of me at school. He too had started school at the same age as I, but he didn't like to be in undue haste in such an important matter as education. He wanted to lay a very solid foundation so that a magnificent structure could be raised upon it. He spent two years where only one was needed and sometimes even three. How can one raise a strong building on a weak foundation? I was the younger and he the elder. I was nine, he was 14. It was his birthright to supervise and admonish me. And propriety required that I should accept his commands as the law. He was studious by nature and always remained glued to his books. Sometimes, perhaps to refresh his mind, he would draw images of birds or dogs or cats on the margins of his book. Occasionally, he repeated the same name, word or sentence many times over. Sometimes he would copy the same couplet again and again in a beautiful hand. And sometimes he would write a set of words that made no sense at all. For example, once I saw this writing in his notebook, special, Amina, brothers, brothers, in reality, brother, brother, Radhesham, Shriyut, Radhesham, for one hour. And at the end, he had drawn the face of a man. I tried very hard to unravel this riddle, but without success. And I had not the courage to ask him. He was in class nine and I was in class five. To try and understand his creation would have been the height of impertinence." End quote. The older brother is the custodian of liberal education. It's, the, it's besides the point to him that he's a failure. Failure introduces stasis and stasis is a kind of expansion in time that lacks the optimism of progress but creates a melancholy ab absorption, an ability to generate mystery and meaning. Quote, special Amina, brothers, brothers, in reality, brother, brother, Radhesham, Sriyud, Radhesham, for one hour. This list, which in the original is special, Amina, Bhayu Bhayu, Darasal, Bhai Bhai, Radhishan, Sri Yukta Radhishan, Ek Ghanta Tak, must comprise one of the most moving instances of literature's ability to create a space of freedom that, that the liberal self can't account for. It exemplifies the way Tagore's Nitto Prabhaita Chetana accommodates detritus, twigs, and branches, the anavashyak, irrelevant, and uddinno khandito whirling fragmentary bits which the authoritarian self keeps out. It's this authoritarian self that Bale Bhai Sahib tries to be for his brother's sake and so effectively fails to become and liberates himself from being. Only in a new kind of short story could this contradictory anti-hegemonic play at once pointless and uplifting have occurred. A lesser account would have jettisoned the story's pointlessness and gone, gone for one of two options, a satire of hubris or a portrait of the tragic delusions of the underprivileged. The colonizer is present in the story but entirely instrumentally, as a nuisance. I quote, if you study English like this, you will go on and on forever and learn nothing. Learning English is no child's be open to anybody, otherwise every man walking in the street would have become a scholar of English. Uh, one has to strain your eyes day and night, burn oneself out, etc., etc. This advice to the younger brother. Again, the colonizer returns in another one of Bade Bhai Sahib's admonitions as he keeps failing 
and the gap between the two brothers narrows. Quote, don't think of my failures. You will know when you come to my class, you will sweat between your teeth when you will have to crack the tough nuts of geometry and algebra and study the history of English thumb. It is not easy to remember, remember the names of kings. There have been no less than eight Henrys. There have been dozens of Jameses, uh, dozens of Williams and in any number of Charleses. It is mind boggling. These wretches couldn't think of a new names. End quote. On the other hand, the younger brother who excels at his studies and catches up with and then outruns his older brother is for all purposes a daydreamer. Quote, I myself never felt at home with books. To sit with a book for an hour was like climbing a mountain. At the first opportunity, I would walk out of the hostel into the open ground and toss pebbles into the air or fly paper butterflies. End quote. So the quality and domains of, of absorption, what Eliot called concentration, translating possibly from dhyan, which in Hindi means both yogic trance and routine study, begin to get mixed up, play, work, attentiveness, immersion, distraction. At the end of the story, Bade Bhai Saab chances upon the narrator kite flying and scolds him at length about the importance of citizenly responsibility. And then, quote, by chance, just at that very moment, a kite came floating over our heads. The end of its string was dangling just above us. A group of boys was chasing it. Bhai Sahab is tall. He jumped and caught hold of the loose end of the kite string. Then he flew off towards the hostel. I ran behind him. End quote. So the story ends. Who's running behind whom? Again and again, the narrative returns to the notion of what makes us free and to the mystery of freedom, confusing us through its juxtapositions. Bade Bhai Sahib, with his clarity of vision, trapped in the classroom. The inconvenient joke of colonization to be got out of the way in an exam paper. The kite floating over our heads. Moved, we, to our surprise, laugh. The melancholy is inseparable from a kind of liberation. I have attempted here to elaborate on my sense that the literatures in Indian languages in their experimentation and their modernism Modernism are powerful not for the political positions they hold, but for their anti-hegemonic play. Given this, they are not paternalistically serious, but essentially joyous. Modernism usually ends where joy does. The citizen takes over. We have an important citizen prototype in the progressive. The person who became a citizen and was secular well before the secular nation state emerged and the constitution was written. We may have not taken enough note of their history. But there is also the other kind of citizen extant even after independence and up to globalization, the citizen of the invisible republic. It's hard when our citizenship is taken away from us, but it's harder when the option of being part of an invisible citizenry vanishes. This has happened, not only with the rise of the Hindu right, but with the onset of free market globalization. Also endangered is our sense of two histories of the secular that well predate the constitution and form our inheritance. The first arising from monotheism and subsequently reform, expressing itself as tolerance and rationality. The, the second are modern literatures expressing themselves through play, the everyday and tapping into not our non-mainstream conceptual lineages like Buddhism, atheistic joy. Today, we must understand and defend both types of citizenship and secular experience. The first variety is fundamentally weakened without the second. It becomes consensual and expresses itself only through reprimand and power. Whatever Premchand might have said at the first meeting of the Progressive Writers Association, he knew and responded to this as a writer. It's time to to extricate modernism from being a glum, mimetic narrative of modern Western history, from seeing its investment in the fragmentary as the consequence of the fragmentation of European society by industrialization and the war. For instance, Rambo's I is another, to give only one example, is conventionally situated in and explained by the anguished fracturing of the self that resulted from the fracturing of European society. This doesn't explain why Rambo feels liberated when he makes that utterance. Liberated from the 
tutelage of Cartesian consciousness and why we feel so buoyant when we, when we encounter his words. How are we to explain modernism's essential air of freedom and delight despite its difficult themes and obscure styles? That delight has to do with the conceptually liberating cultural interfaces in the world in the last 250 years. A revolution that remains a secret but which confuses us through inappropriate, through inappropriate and unaccounted for joy. Thank you. If anybody has kind of survived in their consciousness uh, uh, enough to uh, think of a question, yeah, sure. Yeah, when you're talking about modernism's freedom and joy, it seems to me, and I might be wrong, that you are, it, you, you might be, re, it, it could be a reiteration of something long ago. I mean, is it a, is it a new, occurrence that you are referring to when you are talking about or is it an older older Indianness or an older uh, freedom of pre-colonial but when I'm speaking about modernism's uh, joy and freedom uh, I'm speaking about modernism as a, a as a phenomenon that we think uh, appeared in Europe uh, in the you know, early 20th century, that's how, and, and as far as I can see, uh, appeared in, in, in places like India, maybe, maybe elsewhere, I don't know, but in India, certainly in the 19th century, in the late 19th century, and, and I'm, I'm dating it back to this kind of the late 19th century, um, post 1860s uh, uh, sort of uh, period. And um, I'm I'm, I'm referring to the fact that modernism, uh, as, as, as we often think of it, we think of it in contradictory ways. On the, on the one hand, we uh, think of it and the avant-garde. Let, let's just stick with, uh, you know, Europe and, and, and lay concepts. Uh, lay concepts which are used in, 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 in English departments as well. It's not only lay people who use them. Um, so we see the avant-garde as re representing un uh, unconsciously as some form of progress. Something new has happened. They, they broke through. They, they create something new. They did something new. So the the, the language of development is um, <coughs> converges with with critical language when we speak about modernism in Europe. So then it becomes uh, uh, equivalent to a, a kind of new technology, let's say, that emerged only in Europe. It becomes part of a larger uh, narrative of development. Industrialization took place, this took place, that took place. And then atonal music, uh, you know, etc., uh, fragmenting of form. Uh, th these are on that level joined up with the narrative of development. On the other hand, we know that uh, 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 modernism is a kind of breakdown of those very edifices which uh, the, the rest of the society is trying to build. They are trying to build new edifices. Science is helping them to build new edifices ever since Enlightenment, definitely 19th century onwards in the time of empire, but even later. Make, make, make. We, we heard that you know, the scientific development in the 20th century was such that we developed, we had more change in 60 years than we'd had in 600 or whatever the cliche was, I can't remember. And, and here, positive against this modernism is uh, looking at the fragmentary, is looking at the moment, looking at the momentary. So in that sense, it is not uh, um, going along with this idea at all. Okay, so that, that, that's one thing. Now, when we look at the fragmentary in modernism, then the next moment of mimetic interpretation comes up. Um, it, it, it's, it's fragmented because the society, Western society, which earlier uh, was, was joined together by some way, at one time by the church, later by, uh, the, by, by the king or queen or, 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 or you know, uh, by recognizable enlightenment ideas in which the whole community took part, all of that fragmented by the end of the 19th century. And therefore, form in, in language and in poetry has fragmented. And, and yet, this completely ignores Two things. First is that we go to modernism for extraordinary pleasure 
What kind of pleasure it is. The escape from the suffocation of enlightenment realism. The hatred of the renaissance. Many of these writers and art critics, like let's say like the, the early modernist um, sculptors and artists in Britain, Eric Gill, Clive Bell, the art critic, they all hate the Renaissance. And the, the, the famous exposure to other cultures, whether it's African art or whether it's Japanese print, prints or through various sources, including the early 20th century, Anand Kumar Swami, who is friends with Eric Gill, um, knows uh, this group, Clive Bell, is speaking about Russ. Um, they, they want to be freed of this suffocating representational paradigm. You know, the, the, these, these artists, right from Impressionism onwards. So, um, their exposure to other cultures allows them, and you see this in Clive Bell's book, his reference to other cultures. So for them, this, this it, it's, being free of the Renaissance, being free of the Enlightenment is not traumatic. It is liberating. They want to be free of it. They, those things have reached a dead end as far as these people are concerned. And the same is true of Tagore. You know, already this liberal progressive self is too much to bear. They want something outside. They want to break free. So even if we don't know these histories, when we read these poems, we feel buoyancy, we feel joy, we feel delight. We don't feel a sense of instructedness or constraint. Um, so this is why I want to locate the, the modernism in this particular cultural interface that leads to and involves a conceptual liberation. That you know, I, I do not always have to necessarily, you know, um, my job is not to represent. My job, in a sense, is to be free of that kind of ambition, the constraints of representation. My job is not to tell you a story. My job is not to observe the particular grammar of narrative with all the kind of moral uh, uh, sort of responsibility of telling you about who the man was, what their social media was, uh, and, 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 you know, what their moral universe was. My, my job is to... Uh, to liberate myself from the basis of that particular kind of thinking. That's why it becomes joyous, because there is an immediate sense of release. That, that, that particular kind of, what should I say, poetic thought involves. But where does this poetic thought come from? There is no, there is, there is nothing in the background of Christianity or, or the Enlightenment or medieval writing that accounts for this particular kind of poetic thought. Uh, uh, which is which is liberating. It it, it is, it's only in these um, in these texts which begin to circulate uh, everywhere in Europe. Upanishads, Gita, the thought of Buddhism, which has been coming in earlier with Christian missionaries, which we must begin to see as part of the history not only of thought but of secular thought and of poetic thought. That this begins to happen. One of the reasons, not the only reason, that, that, I mean, as I've said, there are various reasons. Uh, it, it, it's not a question of influence, it's a question of translation into a, a new forms of thought. Uh, the people who conceived of the Upanishads could not have imagined a figure like Abhinavagupta talking about Shanti, which was mentioned in the Upanishads, in relation to a rasa, aesthetic experience. Similarly, I don't think uh, Abhinavagupta could have uh, foreseen Clive well and the translation that would take place there. So I'm not talking about uh, influences, I'm talking about what becomes possible in terms of how we think as we reach a dead end and then happen to come into contact with other forms of thinking. And then how do we reuse those forms of thinking? Thanks for that talk. There's a multi talk and uh, there are a lot of references from everywhere. Uh, just today in the library here, I came across a book called Sanskrit Untranslatables. It's by Ajay Malhotra and somebody, and I suppose it's ideologically motivated, but it uh, 
becomes a part of my question because I think what I want to ask, and I might ramble a little bit, but uh, as he was saying, uh, I don't know if you heard of Brother Nasima. What he tried to do was he asked the question, why did Europe begin the scientific revolution, even though India and China were up to the 15th century more or less ahead of Europe when you had the dark ages in Europe? You know, and then they looked to answer it. And in the same way, Modernism is what you'd associate with Europe because it comes after the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. And so, your whole uh, talk, as it were, is situated in a European milieu, and in some ways, what you're trying to do is to talk about how it isn't necessarily European, but perhaps more global. And you had these inputs, like you just said, from the Upanishads and the Gita and all of that. So, I think, uh, suppose my question is. Uh, Going back to the Sanskrit untranslatables, uh, to what extent would you say that something like modernism could have been born in India itself or in the East, as it were, if there hadn't been hypothetically a kind of organization of the world by Europe, and how you whether you sort of see the same arc as has been followed in reality in a sort of hypothetical manner also. So, yeah. um, so um, <clears throat> one of the ways we might think of modernism in India is that it came in as a, uh, um, as a literary movement through, through, through exposure to colonialism. Uh, and and uh, what I'm saying is, uh, is is not that at all. Uh, I'm saying that there's a common exposure to a set of texts, and there's also a common exposure of uh, of, of, of of a liberal inwardness, of, of an individualism across many societies. And then uh, those who want to opt out of that uh, of that individualism and and see a new possibility in the domain of the literary, which is emerging in the sense we know it through modernism and the modern as a new domain, um, are doing so through, uh, through references to um, various forms of thought, which allow them to get out of the things that preoccupy the liberal. the individual and representing the individual and through the representation of the individual to exercise a kind of power. What Said says about, says about Orientalism is true of realism. It's not only true of Orientalism, it's true of realism that, that it is an exercise of power on, on society in that we decide how to represent it and imagine it. So when Virginia Woolf is uh, disagreeing with Arnold Bennett or fighting back with Arnold Bennett. He, she cites the fact that, uh, you know, Arnold Bennett is saying to me, Virginia Woolf is saying, uh, saying to me that I don't know how to write about character. And the way he writes about character, way, the way Arnold Bennett thinks is the right way of writing about character is this, that, you know, I describe the person, I describe this woman, I describe her hair, what she wears, I describe her, her inner self, her thoughts, her psychology. Then I describe the room she's in. By describing the room she's in, I'm giving information about her social media. Then I describe the view from the window of the room in which I give further information to the reader about the social media of this particular protagonist. Uh, my uh, my sort of um, vision thereby remains human centered. It uh, emerges from an enlightenment humanism. But I think my one uh, job as a novelist, me being Arnold Bennett, is to uh, uh, represent the journey of a human being represented here by this woman. And everything else that is there in the story, whether it's the room or the view out of the window, is part of important in as much as it gives us a sense of the journey of that human being. But for, 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 for Wolf, uh, it's far more dispersed than that. The human being is not an uh, invention made up of an exterior and interior, and nor is the human being the most important thing in the story. Uh, the, you know, the window, 
the view from the window, the room itself, all have equal significance. When all have equal significance, centrality of the human being begins to disperse. Um, so we are talking about a form of exercising power, which Wolf is uh, sort of refuting. This, the, the, and as, as I said, this form of exercising power in the time of empire takes many uh, forms. I mean, uh, Orientalism is, is, is one of them. We forget that realism, the Renaissance are other forms of exercising power. Now, oh, through, through representation, we only think of Orientalism. Now, there are many critiques of knowledge as power or exercising power. Uh, that which are poetic critiques and not just riposts like uh, Said's Orientalism was. And these poetic critiques, if they are modernists, they go back to the beginning of, you know, what we know of written text to uh, the Upanishads are, is a, mod is a modernist text. I mean, the, the khayal from uh, the early part of the 20th century, I was saying yesterday, is a modernist form. Um, uh, we, we, we have trouble situating these in modernism, firstly, because we associate modernism with modernity, with a particular era. And also because we, uh, we, we want to situate literature and intellectual movements and something like modernism within a bourgeoisie. So we cannot think of how notions, bourgeois notions like experiment, avant-garde, literature, modernism, work outside of a bourgeoisie. Like, how is Amir Khan, Ustad Amir Khan, an experimenter? Implicit in that question is, but he's not a bourgeois. He's, he, he, he comes from, a, from an ancient lineage, which may or may not be true. So immediately, we do not think of them as experimenters. Experimenters are those who are striving to experience new forms of delight in art by, 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 by testing form. Because the form has become dead, you know, uh, Joyce gets rid of words, modernists get rid of, um, play around with the grammar and get rid of conjunctions, con conjunctive words and, or, or, or whatever, because there, there many, or many words seem like dead words. Uh, as you're writing, you see, this is a dead word. It's just playing the role of a conjunction. So you get rid of it. What is the reason that one is doing this and making thereby language strange? It is because you want to get rid of those, of, of that deadness. Deadness, what is dead? Uh, routine ways of thinking. That words like and, and uh, or consolidate. So you get rid of them. You, then you create strangeness. The, the, the attack on routine ways of thinking is there in various domains. All those domains I've got, I, I, can, I could call modernist, wherever they are, or whichever century they are in. It's certainly not something that happened in the West. It goes way, way back. Uh, uh, if you look at the Upanishads, if you look at the Gita, which we tend to think of a religious text because there is Krishna in it, but this Krishna's ventriloquizing these conceptual things to do with Brahma. It's not the Krishna either of the Bhagavad Purana or of, of the Mahabharata. It's a very odd Krishna in the Gita. So if we look at these texts, they are arguing against other texts. They're arguing against other positions. We're looking at something. How old is it? 2000 years old? But they are not originally texts. We think of them as, as, as kind of stating something. They are not, they are arguing against positions. They're again and again saying, uh, and uh, we must remember that, that these, these were anomalous texts. They're, they're not central texts. Certain philosophers are trying to bring them into the, into the discussion, renovate the discussion. Shankar, Shankaracharya is one of them who, who has very interesting thoughts about what, what, what these words mean, for instance, these puzzling words, um, Ananda, Brahman, and, and this puzzling word uh, in, in Buddhism, Shunya, Shunyata. Uh, these are all conceptual interventions. They are not mainstream, by the way. I mean, I, as we know, Buddhism anyway got kicked out of India a long time ago. So we are looking at um, submerged conceptual lineages. And now we can build a kind of uh, statue of Shankaracharya and, and you know, uh, 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 kitchify that, 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 that uh, inheritance without ever really thinking about what 
what that inheritance is doing. That inheritance is an argument against our default selves. Just as Wolf is arguing against Bennett, they are also arguing against our default selves. They are also arguing against somebody. They are saying, those who believe this, those who believe knowledge is the only way, that's wrong. Those who believe action is the only way, that's wrong. This the Brahman is this, 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 and not what over here they adore. So these are texts in argument with other hegemonies at the time. We don't, we have forgotten what those hegemonies are. In that sense, they too are modern. They too are, they too are trying to liberate themselves at that point of time. So, um, I would say that any, any text, any form of thinking that rebels against the human tendency uh, to use no uh, knowledge to codify and ho hold power over and representation is one of them, which is why the translation into the arts is a very important one because on some level the arts is involved with representation, but in a very different way, let's say from other forms of knowledge. Uh, I would say all of these are in their own way precursors of or are indeed instances of this thing we call this particular argument we call modernism. Very quick, you had talked about uh, the underpinning of the anchor of modernism in the Western world, monarchs, kings, church. What about markets and the sense of self which you talked about emergent in Bengal in the 19th century? Um, has been critiqued by later Marxist scholars, as you know, as the bourgeois self. So uh, the Lesbian economy had to be tuned with the mercantile capitalism, industrial capitalism was still young. So any thoughts on that? I was talking, uh, I was talking about uh, underpinnings not of modernism, but I was talking about what modernism was reacting against, the, the, the shackles created by uh, the Enlightenment. Uh, you know, the various things that we say that faded away, which caused disenchantment, uh, and then leads to um, modernism's disenchanted sort of uh, poetics. Uh, I, I just see as wrong because my modernism poetics is not disenchanted but enchanted. So uh, the, the, what, what what is happening is that modernism is disenchanted with with the Renaissance, with the Enlightenment. It it, it doesn't want to. It's not as if it, the Enlightenment ended. Modernists came into being because people were, were extremely anxious about the Enlightenment ending. They wanted the Enlightenment to end. Modernism is a critique of the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment knows no enchantment. It is completely unidirectional. And the, the, the modernists want to create a space for enchantment. It is an atheistic space. Now, as far as uh, the, 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 the Shibnath Shastri, Begmal Renaissance and the Marxists, yeah, so, uh, the, uh, yeah, uh, um, I mean, that's fair enough. I mean, uh, I, I think that's uh, uh, the Marxists turn upon themselves, as it were, uh, uh, when they critique the Bengal Renaissance. And uh, what, what, what are the grounds of uh, the, 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 it's not very clear, the grounds of the Marxist critique of the Bengal Renaissance, except that it is an elite Renaissance. There are the mercantile elite and uh, th th there's also this thing that th th they have the hubris to uh, use the term renaissance and thereby imply that they were this, it, 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 this was a phenomenon equal to the re or somehow reminiscent of the European renaissance. And, uh, um, and they say, you know, the European renaissance was this, 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 and, you know, the, the Bengal renaissance. Is, is deeply unequal, all of that. Um, uh, I would only uh, respond, see, one can go on for such a long time talking about this, but I would only respond with one point, is that the, the Bengal Renaissance is not an attempt to rehearse the European Renaissance as far as uh, a, a very important part of the Renaissance, if we still use that term for it, is concerned, that is the arts, poetry, the imagination, which is a very important part of what we call that particular phenomenon. It is an attempt to critique the European Renaissance. If you go to uh, North Calcutta and if you go to Jorashakur and 
10 minutes away if you go to Mollik Bari. Mollik Bari, the, uh, the Mollik Palace was created by uh, um, somebody who had made their money in gold trade, I think. And that is a, a kind of house that would, that, uh, would have existed everywhere had uh, Bengal and India embraced the European Renaissance. When you go to Tagore's house and you find uh, a, a particular uh, form of interior where uh, simple textures and space predominate instead of the neoclassical figures of the Mollik body, where you see that there is a rejection of that particular imagination going on. So the Bengal Renaissance in its, uh, in its embrace of, let us say, the incomplete frescoes of Ajanta, uh, in, in many of their preoccupations with, with texture, uh, are, uh, are reacting against the, the hyper-realism uh, of, the, of the Renaissance, of neoclassicism. They turn against the monumental. The, 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 the neoclassical, the Renaissance, uh, the European Renaissance um, advocates the monumental. It builds monuments. There are no monuments in Calcutta to speak of. The most in, in, in important and interesting monuments are people's houses. You know, I mean, you go to somebody's house, you find more uh, uh, about that history there. Then you, then uh, Victorian Memorial is a very uh, boring, boring place, and and there are there are no other places to speak of. It's an anti-monumental modernity. So it, it, the, the Bengal Renaissance, unlike, I mean, that, I don't think the Marx is taking into account how counter the European Renaissance its uh, its agenda is. Thank you very much. I Thank think you. it was a real pleasure Thank to you. have you here. Thanks. And I'm sure that everybody enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.